We've got the CEO of Franco Nevada joining me on the desk. Sales and profit beating expectations, but the company warning that their gold equivalent ounces could come in at the lower end of their forecast. Joining me now for some perspective is Paul Brink, president and CEO of Franco Nevada. Thanks so much for being with me. Thank you for having me. Let, oh, I will talk about your company, don't worry. But can we just spend a minute on gold? I mean, what role is gold going to have if we've, we've canceled the recession? Uh, Bitcoin is now digital gold. Are these conversations you're having with investor bases, you're trying to say, yeah, we still have a place in the portfolio? Oh, ab absolutely. The, uh, always a conversation and, and the outlook for gold is good. The, in the current environment, um, the, the, the big driver has been rates. Yeah. Six months ago, we thought that we were seeing the peak in U.S. rates. Bit of a false start. The economy proved stronger and they've continued to raise rates. Uh, so that's a bit of a headwind to gold currently. Uh, but expect that once we see the peak in rate, uh, you'll really see gold prices have a second leg to the run. Once we see the peak in rates, it should be a risk on trade, right? Uh, go, go long equities, your junk bonds. How does gold factor into kind of a, a, a risk on environment? Well, I think in that environment, you would have seen, uh, it really means the economy would have slowed. I see, okay. That the, the, the Fed is comfortable saying we can stop raising rates. So you've got two things. Um, the relative attractiveness of debt goes down. Uh, so gold is more attractive. Um, the, the other part of that is with the economy slowing down, you likely see the U.S. dollar weaken. Right. And gold tends to trade the other direction to the U.S. dollar. So both of those would be good positives. So let's talk about um, this set of quarterly results. Um, I mentioned, you know, kind of the forecast for gold equivalent ounces. What, what's driving that? Is it a lower gold price or issues you're having in some of your the, the mines that you stream from? So first of all, in, in terms of our quarter, it, it was a good quarter, really driven by our, our core assets. Uh, Cobra Panama and Pakai, two of our biggest assets, both had short-term issues in the first quarter, recovered very nicely in the second quarter, and that uh, underpinned the result in the quarter. Uh, most of our portfolio is gold and precious metals. Some of what we have are interests in uh, very long-dated iron ore deposits and also oil and gas deposits. Those two commodities, the prices have been weaker through the first two quarters. Um, so when it's really taking that into account uh, when we point to our overall guidance for the year. Uh, that we'll say it'll be at the low end of the range. Right. Uh, although oil and gas prices are, are currently picking up, so we may, we may be proven wrong. That could be a bit of a surprise if it, if it proves sustainable. I mean, as we're talking about gold and oil and gas, it seems like in mining, all anybody can talk about is copper. We need yep. more copper. Um, even, you know, Barrick Gold is talking about yeah. uh, uh, we need more copper. Um, does that, you think, down the road start to become a significant area for you in terms of offer, offering financing to these kind of projects? It's a big part of our business in two different ways. The first is most of the big precious metal streams that we have, gold and silver, are actually byproduct from big copper mines. Okay. So Cobre Panama, and Pacay, Antimina, Candelaria. So we're in the business of financing big copper mines. Uh, the world does need a lot more copper. Uh, there's a huge amount of capital that will be needed for that. Um, that is the uh, uh, very core to our business, providing that capital. Uh, the other thing we like to do when it comes available is buy royalties on copper mines. And when you look longer dated in our portfolio, we have royalties on a number of mines that we hope are the, are the next generation of copper mines. Cascabel in Ecuador, in Ecuador Tac Tac in Argentina, mm -hmm. River Union in Chile. Uh, so copper will be a big part of our future. You, when you talk about financing these projects, especially with long duration assets, um, interest rates obviously factor into it, except you're not financing through debt. Yep. That's lucky. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it was luckier planned. It, well, it's, it, it's very purposeful. And, and it yeah. starts with, you know, our belief is gold is a risk off investment. Uh, so we want to create our company as the lowest risk uh, option for gold investors. Because of that, you don't want a lot of financial leverage to start. Uh, second is we want to be providing capital into the markets when capital is scarce. Uh, so you don't want to be carrying a lot of debt on your balance sheet that, that you and yourself don't have capital in, in the hard times. Uh, so our view always has been limit the amount of debt, uh, ideally have as much cash as, as possible. And, you know, the last couple of years post-COVID, the world has been awash in, in cash. Yeah. Not a good time to put a lot of capital to work. Uh, now with rates tightening, we're moving into a, a world where capital is less available. 
Uh, and so our, our team is looking to be more active. More deal flow. Hopefully. How much more? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, we've got 2.3 billion of available capital, both cash and available facilities. Uh, you, we, you know, there, there's, so you don't there, have to raise equity? No, no need for raising yeah, yeah, equity yeah. At, at, at this stage. We're, we're very well positioned and uh, have a very strong treasury. So what's the sticking point in these deals? Like what stops, what often stops you from, from you know, signing on the dotted line? Uh, it's always around asset quality. It's around valuation. And in our business, a lot of it is around patience. Uh, wait until you have the good opportunities to get into the good deposits. Uh, our experience in mining is it's the great deposits of the world that actually get better over time. Mm -hmm. uh, but they only come around once in a while. So uh, be patient. We're happy to build up cash on our balance sheet uh, until the right opportunities come along. It's proved to work very well for us in the past. I'd love to get your views just as somebody who's in the industry uh, of the kind of consolidation that we're seeing and the scale that we see it, certainly with Newmont and Newcrest. Um, Barrick, of course, has kind of opted a, a, a different track, and some of the complaints have been, well, does size really matter when you're a miner? What kind of efficiencies can you get when you've got mines kind of all over the world? How do you think about that? I think uh, the biggest driver in some of that consolidation has, has been the environment. Getting big mines permitted gets tougher and tougher. So if you can buy into an operating mine, so much the better. The second is, you know, over the last couple of years, the amount of inflation that you've seen in capital costs and, and also the supply mm -hmm. chain constraints have made it very difficult for anybody to undertake a big new project. So all those things, you know, push the big players to say, if I can buy an existing project, so much the better, and I think that's that's been behind a lot of the deals.